Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Glimsdale, and my guest this week is Valerie Choniak, kind of like cognac, but different. She is a patient experience executive who specializes in human-centered design and organizational transformation. She leads enterprise-wide consumer assessments of healthcare providers and systems and health outcomes survey performance and value-based care efforts of global and professional direct contracting and Medicare Advantage lines of regional or of business at Agilon Health. Valerie's 20 years of experience combined shaping guests, customers, members, employees, providers, and patient experiences from corporate hospitality to across the healthcare continuum. She has a Master of Public Administration and Healthcare Administration Management, a Certified Patient Experience Professional through the Patient Experience Institute, and a founding member of the Patient Experience Community. Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast, Valerie. Thank you for having me, Nick. It's an absolute pleasure, and I'm I'm really excited and eager to to jump in. Yeah, you and me both. Uh, just our our pre call. I think we could have recorded that, and it would have been uh, just as just as valuable. But um, I'm excited to see what this what we got going here. Uh, so sure. the first question I ask every single guest at the very beginning is, "What's one thing people might not know about Valerie?" Sure. Uh, one thing people might not know about me is I used to coach junior Olympic athletes. In volleyball, I coached a different team of 16-year-olds every year uh, about seven years ago for about seven years. And while we worked on volleyball fundamentals, my coaching style really centered on teaching them how to be leaders on and off the court uh, and then to better understand strategies to compete on that national or regional or local level. Um, I would explain you could be the best player skill-wise, but if someone isn't feeling well, uh, their significant other broke up with them. They just failed their math test. Um, they're having troubles at home. You know, all that stuff will impact who shows up on the court that day mentally. And even something as simple as, you know, the girl on the other side of the court. I mean, these were 16-year-old girls. You know, someone could have better braids and better mascara, and it would wreak havoc on their on their minds. So I first and foremost had to teach them all about, you know, will over skill, mental over physical, and truly just building their confidence in the game. Um, and till this day, you know, a lot of them have graduated college already. I feel old now. Um, and <laughs> they will still reach out to me and, you know, get my advice on things. And, you know, it's all about teaching them about leadership and winning things like psychological safety that are big now, critical thinking skills. And um, I absolutely love it. In fact, reminiscing now, Nick, you're really making me want to get back into coaching volleyball and coaching people. Um it was definitely a passion of mine, but right now, something else people might not know about me, my three kids come first in this season. So maybe when they're a little bit older, I'll get back to it. It's very cool. Uh, I, I I like the fact that you brought in the critical thinking and the psychology side of it, because uh, I, for those who don't know, I ran in college and I had the opportunity to, to compete at a, at a decent level, um, not quite the Olympics, but um, you know, I think that mindset and continuing to train and visualize and, and to add that training and have that compounding interest on top of each other and all of these things to create that the best experience possible to succeed. And I think that pertains a lot to that patient experience as well of, you know, it's not just about the customer or the patient. It's not just about the hospital or, or the clinic or the ER for that matter, but it's, it's everything that's involved in one. And uh, so that's, that's kind of where I want to start too, is, you know, I think customer experience means a lot of things to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And if I ask somebody who doesn't know the word customer or customer experience, they kind of gave a, a decent version of it, but I'd love to get your perspective on what does patient experience mean to you? Yeah. Patient experience, human experience, Experience to me means emotions, mm -hmm. memories, perceptions, organizational culture, human behavior, behavioral science, psychology, like you said, uh, participation, interactions, connections, consistency, compassion or lack thereof, um, really just conscious living. You know, whether we focus on it or not, whether we say the words patient experience or not experience is still happening. And I think that, you know, if it's happening every day and all around us, that it's not necessarily a tool, it's not necessarily technology or a feedback system. It's literally 
as you had alluded to, that end-to-end -end involvement of all the words that I just mentioned in business, your product, your services, market brand, or even a person's personal reputation experience is built on the foundation of human perceptions and their emotional responses and reactions to it. So that, that might be an ambiguous response, but it's because I think experience is ambiguous because it's different for each one of us, mm. even patients. That's so awesome. I, I love that answer. If you would have, if I would ask that answer or that question 10 years ago, would it have changed in any way? No, I don't think so. I mean, we have more uh, formal definitions like the Barrel Institute's definition that I absolutely love. It's based on the perceptions that people have throughout the healthcare continuum. So they get it. You know, I think that everybody's experience is indeed personal to them. And we have to be conscious that um, while we try to fit everybody in this box, like that's not, that's not feasible. And, and I don't think that that will ever change. I think we need to change our perception of how we're approaching healthcare and this one size fits all is not sustainable. So you're saying we actually have to care about the human being. Yeah, first. What a concept, right? <laughs> Weird. And then yeah. personalize it to their needs and expectations. That's right. Absolutely. Hmm. I think we could just pause this episode now and it would just be a successful one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's not though, because there's so sure, much sure. other goodness in there. Um, so when it comes to the patient experience, how do you, how do organizations, how do the healthcare industry make it, make it in an exceptional one? Yeah, I think the key to an exceptional experience is great leaders need to get really intentional, really intentional and proactive and consistent in their delivery, meaning they have to use their vision and mission as their North Star to build those strategies, not just the tactics, to really reimagine how we're approaching patient experience, you know, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. You can't just talk about patient experience to make it real. You have to use your vision to inspire people. You know, people always talk about um, motivating others, but I firmly believe you can't motivate others. You have to inspire them and then they have to motivate themselves. Um, and then understand the results and the expectations from your customers, whether they're internal or external. You know, Nick, I can't begin to tell you how often I hear uh, from employees how awful their own experience is. And then you have leadership that expects them to deliver for their customers. And it's like, well, if you're not serving your internal customers, your own employees, how can you expect them to give give their all? So of course that's not gonna lead to, to a good customer experience. So, um, we have to realize that it's human experience at the end of the day, everybody's impacted, patient facing, patient impacting, everyone you serve. Uh, leaders have to properly level set and manage various different expectations. So, so yes, I would say providing service excellence and setting and managing those patient expectations is key because from a psychological perspective, patients, people base their own expectations on their current environment and past experiences in that environment or one like it. So as an example, Nick, if you go out to eat at a casual dining restaurant and you order boneless buffalo wings, what's your expectation? How, how long should it take to hit the table? So if I were to answer that, I would say if it was busy 20 minutes. If it was not busy, 15. You're very nice. That's very nice of you. Most people don't care how busy it is and they want consistency. With that being said, I would agree with you. 15 minutes. And I think, or I would guess many of your listeners would probably feel the same way. Now, does that mean that me and you and all of your listeners have gone out to eat with each other? No, but we all have similar expectations because we've all been in that environment of casual dining. We've been in it more than once. So it dictates to us how long we should wait for those boneless buffalo wings to hit the table. Now, to your point, if it's busy, as long as you have your two for one beer or two for one margarita, you're feeling good, right? So you're willing to wait a little bit longer. But the majority of us have that same expectation, unless someone's never gone out to eat for casual dining, or maybe they're a vegan and they never ordered boneless buffalo wings for an appetizer. I would guess to say that even those people then might not even have an expectation of what to expect. So they'd be a little bit more open. Why? Because if they have been in that environment, and I've said it a million times, but I'll say it again, this is how people create those expectations. They've been in that environment. They've been in it more than once. That restaurant, that business, that healthcare organization has created an, an expectation that now dictates how the customer should feel and what they should experience in that environment. So if it takes longer than those 20 minutes, you're going to be upset. 
You're going to be a little hangry, hungry and angry. If it takes under that 15 minutes, you're elated. Same thing with waiting on hold. If I press one for Nick and expect to wait forever and only 30 seconds after 30 seconds you pick up, I'm delighted. I'm thrilled. But if I wait five minutes or more for you to pick up, I'm sure you have a better statistic on that for, for contact centers, but that grumpiness starts to set in. Now I'm in that purgatory of waiting for someone and I'm, I have no sense of power because you're not giving me options to leave my number and I'm just waiting on hold. So hopefully I have other tasks that, that I can do while I'm waiting. You know, so, so the more consistent, the more predictable, the more satisfied customers will be, the more inconsistent and unpredictable, the more likely I'm going to complain, I'm going to begin to create that expectation in my own head, that story, that narrative of how I think things should go. And then it's going to spiral out of control because I'm going to try to validate in my own head, why did I choose this business or product or service to begin with? It's leaving me with this awful feeling and now I have this awful perception and it's no different in healthcare, right? Whether people are waiting in the waiting room or whether they're waiting on the phone or you know, their interaction with somebody else, human behavior wise, they're, they're feeling like someone's being rude or they're not communicating or providing them the right information. It's all about setting and managing expectations up front. So you don't leave people to their own devices of how things should go, because then at least now they know, okay, this is what I should expect. So I would say that is the, uh, the key to an exceptional experience. So I, I think it's, I find it curious that you, you ended with setting expectations. When, when I'm on the phone, if I bring it back to the contact center, mm -hmm. I'm on the phone and let's say a healthcare company or an insurance company says, hey, Nick, your call is very important to me. Please hold for 40 minutes. You are number 46 in line. And I'm like, great. You don't have a callback <laughs> option. And, and then it clicks on again, music plays, it clicks back on and says, hey, your call is very important to me. You are now number 42. Mm -hmm. And how how can organizations, healthcare or not, set that expectation up front? Be very uh, around um, framing that conversation around. Let's say if somebody's having a surgery, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to take two hours, and you're in there for three. What does that look like? And how do you set that expectations and communicate them past that gray area of of the unknown? Because anytime that unknown happens is usually the worst case scenario from that person who's waiting. And it, it doesn't matter if it's an emergency or if it's waiting for my burger at a drive-thru. Mm -hmm. I have an expectation. And if if you're not communicating with me, I'm going to get frustrated. Yeah, sure. So that's, that's a lot to dig into. Uh, I would first say that your contact center example, where you're number 46 and the number 45, I don't know if that's level setting expectations, because what does that number even mean to me besides the fact that this is where I am in line? I don't know the average time it takes for you to take care of a customer, and I'm not saying you should provide that. It's better to set an expectation through your actions sometimes, not necessarily what you're saying. So in that example, you know, patients, people, when they're on hold, customers, it's not so much the wait, it's the duration of the wait that is bothering them. So rather than tell me I'm number 46 on hold, try to get consistent in taking care of people within, you know, three rings or getting consistent in, you know, having me on hold less than five minutes. I don't know what the contact center standard is, the gold standard, but making sure that you're also providing people with information and education while they're on hold, right? If you don't want to be on hold, you can go to our website and go here and we can get back to you within the same day. Great. Now, at least you're giving me an out. Like I made mention of that purgatory. <laughs> if you give me options that make me feel powerful, now at least I know I don't have to sit and wait if I don't want to. There's other things that I can do. Or if you're providing me that information and education, maybe there is something, you know, healthcare related that has to do with how I get my medical record or that I could sign up for the portal, which is a better way to communicate. I think in the example of um, surgery, you know, you have some hospitals now that on a TV, just like... Um, with uh, pizza delivery, right? The, they show you like where they are at in the process. Like, okay, your your loved one has just been sedated. You know, it doesn't have any PHI information on there, but it lets you know where they're at in the process. Okay, now the the physician is starting the surgery. Uh, the the surgery, um, you know, is going well, and it gives them a step by step playbook. So again, 
instead of me sitting there and waiting and wondering and assuming the worst of, oh my goodness, you know, my grandfather passed away getting open heart surgery. I hope that doesn't happen to my dad. And now again, I'm creating that narrative in my head. Now I can just sit back and have a little bit more peace of mind because you're providing me that information, that education, that communication up front that says how my loved one is doing in the surgery. And that is a great way to set expectations too. So being mindful of what's important to that person and meeting them where they're at is huge. And being able to not think of things of what's best for me and my system, but no, what's best for my customers. I know that sounds so cliche, but so many organizations don't do that very well. And I'm not saying it's easy to do, but I think even trying a little bit, you know, someone that goes to the same hotel all the time and um, the hotel recognizes that they always eat the red apples, but they never eat the green ones. So the next time that they're visiting them, they only put red apples in their room. Like that type of personalized experience is huge. And you notice those little things that make such a huge difference because they're memorable. And so when you're able to see what your customer likes and you're able to meet them where they're at, I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't get better than that. Hmm. I like that. You mentioned psychology a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. What does, I think we can go deep into psychology and, and what that means, but how does that align with the patient experience? Yeah, a lot, a lot. You know, there's so much research out there that talks about how people are more likely to remember an experience more clearly, especially when it's associated with strong emotion, right? You think about 9-11, you think about your child's birth, you think about someone passing away, you know, it's very, very vivid. And those memories directly impact the psychology and therefore future human behavior, such as interacting with others and making decisions. Going back to having a baby, you know, I, I worked in the hospital for a very long time and I remember um, father and mother, it was their second baby and dad comes like, like a bull in a china shop coming in saying, I, I need pillows and I need the extra bed in my wife's room and I need this and I need that. And the staff found him to be so difficult. But when I actually sat down and took the time to talk to him, he was like, well, let me tell you how the birth of our first child went and how when I asked for a bed, they said that they didn't have any or they didn't know where the extra pillows were. So I'm trying to be proactive now. And it's like, again, if you actually take the time to understand the psychology and why he was acting that way, because they didn't set good expectations first, right? They, they, they didn't the first time that he was there and now he's carrying that over into his second visit. Nobody knows why it's like, oh, he just walked in. We didn't even do anything yet. Well, well you did a couple of years ago when he was here, you might not remember and it might not have stuck out in your mind because you just couldn't find the pillow. But let me tell you how, how much that impacted their experience and their comfort level. Um, you know, research also indicates people don't always remember their experiences as they objectively happened. So more so through their own subjective or personal lens, again, how it made that individual feel their perception, kind of like the internet phenomenon of the dress. You remember that? The, the, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a blue and black dress, by the it way. It was definitely blue. Like yeah. <laughs> Not white and gold. But I use that example in a lot of my trainings because people have various different perceptions. And for those that didn't see the dress as blue or black or didn't see it as white and gold, you know, some saw it as olive green, some saw it as purple. And I would say, does that make them the difficult customer, the difficult patient in the room because they see things differently than you do? Of course not, right? So considering the psychology of experience in general and more specifically patient experience comes down to that notion that our primary goal is to influence perception enough that it really improves a patient's physical and mental health. And of course, obviously their quality of life. I think leaders have to focus on striving to create those optimal experiences through, again, managing those expectations. Um, so patients aren't, aren't left alone to those cognitive biases and their personal expectations, or even just chance alone of something else happening. Um, I would say for the past two decades, patient experience has been plagued with the same challenges, right? Like we're not getting traction. They're getting plagued with the same challenges that we've been trying to solve logically time and time again. So as an example, long wait time to see a doctor. Okay, let's try to logically solve that by changing their scheduling template, telling them that they can only have a 15 visit 
15 minute visit with a patient. Uh, let's start charging patients who are late or are no show or that ruin our whole scheduling throughout the day. Wrong. <laughs> Pati again, it goes back to our, our previous conversation. Patients are not upset about the wait time itself. They're upset about the duration or how long it feels without being communicated or informed uh, or giving them a distraction in the meantime. Uh, meaning if I go online and I see your urgent care says there's a 10 minute wait and then I get there, check in and the wait's really an hour, I'm going to be really annoyed and really frustrated. If I went online and saw the wait was an hour and I got there and the wait was an hour and then someone just took the time to reiterate that the wait was going to be an hour, this is what you should expect, then I'm pleased. So the irony there is that it's the same hour of time, but handled differently. Again, it's not the weight that upsets people. It's it's the duration of the weight. So going back, going back to your original question about psychology, I always go down like these rabbit holes. So going back to psychology, this practical, logical solution approach is not enough to drive and change and transform the human experience in healthcare. We need to begin to use a psychological approach. That means if your logical solutions haven't prevailed, if they haven't worked after 20 years, it's time to take a different approach, a psychological one and meet patients where they're at, not where you'd like them to be. Hmm. And it sounds like that you're trying to meet them where they're at in the things that they're saying, based off what I just heard you say, the things that they're saying aren't always what is truth, but you still have to have empathy in the moment, hear them out, hear where they are today and how you can help solve that or just provide that empathy and be present because sometimes somebody who didn't get those two, two pillows prior or that extra bed wasn't heard the first time. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a guy that I interviewed a long time ago. His name is Derek Gaunt. He's actually uh, Chris Voss's uh, partner in crime. At, awesome. uh, and, and he said that, um, his quote that always resonates with me is unaddressed emotions never die. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that can relate to so many things. And just think of that patient experience of that guy with the bed. Yeah. He it's, wants to be validated and heard. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, you I would take what you said a step further and say that there are three sides to every story, right? There's your truth. There's my truth. And then the truth. So while your truth might not match my truth or the truth itself, it's still true for me. And you have to validate that, right? It, it, at the end of the day, it might not be um, a problem that you cause, but as your customer, it's still your problem to resolve, right? Yeah. And, I, and I think people get into the habit of um, not wanting to apologize, not wanting to be accountable and the reality is it's not about displacing blame. It's just making things right at the end of the day. You know, I don't care what your problems are. I just want you to make mine right and make me feel good in that process. And we get too hung up on um, feeling like it's a personal issue when it's not. If they don't know you personally, don't take it personally. So what do you think of the word or the phrase, I'm sorry? when it mm. doesn't, when it's not actually meant, it's just kind of this filler word that somebody says after somebody vomits on them, their, their issues or problems or concerns. Yeah. I, I, I don't think we should ever have to apologize. I think we should always be able to turn things around. So especially to your point, like if it's not like truly felt, if it's not sincere, you know, even if it's walking into a meeting late, instead of, oh, I'm so sorry, you can just say thank you for your patience, mm -hmm. right? Like that will still convey the same, I'm validating the fact that I'm late, but I don't have to say I'm sorry if I don't feel that truly. Because I think for, what did Voss say? I listened to his, and he said one third of people, right? They're like very irritated by it. So that goes yeah. back to creating that. You can be consistent in the fact of knowing there's different ways to apologize but also being consistent that 30% of people hate it and getting to know that person. And are you really apologizing for something or are you just saying it because, you know, you, you have a script that says you should. Two very or you things. think that might make them feel better. Right. Mm. Right. Man, I, I could keep talking uh, <laughs> about, about that as well. But, um, you know, I, when it comes to the patient experience, I feel like 
you said the definition has not changed in the last 10 years. I, I said at the beginning, but mm-hmm. has the expectations of the patient changed in let's say the f- last five or 10 years? Has the expectation changed? I would say, especially with COVID, I don't think patient expectations have necessarily changed per se, but I do think that they've certainly been accelerated or amplified. And I guess that goes back to why I don't feel that the definition has changed much either, but the Mm -hmm. feelings associated with it have just been amplified tremendously. I think patients expect more uh, technology when it comes to low emotional monotonous tasks. So what do I mean by, by that? Like freely accessing their medical records right? Maybe through through the patient portal or getting their test results online or what tests they should, upcoming tests or preventative visits they should have, uh, being able to easily communicate with their care team or being able to schedule, reschedule, even cancel an appointment electronically. Those are the task or transactional low emotion, shouldn't take much effort, but a couple clicks, which then leads to number two, I think prioritizing convenience and seamless experiences. Patients don't want friction. They want easy, quick, cost-effective care that they, can, that they can navigate and understand. And if these things become highly frustrating, right, that friction, then that's when that high emotion piece comes in and they need a human as soon as possible because AI, technology, or a computer is not going to de-escalate me. <laughs> it's only going to escalate the problem. I mean, how often have I been on the phone where I'm like, agent, agent, yeah. representative, representative, yeah. like trying to tell this computer I want to speak to a human being because the technology, uh, not only was it not intuitive enough to handle my issue, or even if it was, it didn't matter. I wanted to be validated and heard, right? What we talked about before by a human being. So, um, you know, wanting a real human to provide me that emotional relief and a solution to my healthcare related emotional issue, I want to feel like a human, not a number, a diagnosis, statistic, or a dollar sign. And um, so do I, do I think expectations have changed? No, we all want to feel like humans. We all want to be interconnected. Neurologically, we crave that. Um, I just think it's certainly been exponentially really brought to life, especially in the employee experience realm, when we see so much about now in healthcare, you know, whether it's staffing, uh, employees not wanting to go to work because they have all this moral injury, um, or, you know, they're just feeling really burnt out. So we need to really relook at the approach of experience for internal and external customers, for sure. I was told one time that use the machine or the AI for the mundane mm-hmm. and use the human for the heart. Yeah. I lo- oh, I love that. I might steal that. That's good. Yeah. It's all yours. Steal it. I love it. But I think it's so important if, if somebody actually wants to talk to a human being, allow them to talk to a human being in the least amount of effort mm-hmm. and on the channel of their choice. If somebody wants to reset their password because they can't get into the portal, let them do that based off a couple authentications in the least amount of effort, but allow them to improve that experience in the way that they want. It kind of goes back to that personalization. Mm-hmm. If there was one lady that I, I was told that at an insurance company who would call like every single Wednesday at two o'clock because she was bored, not because she actually wanted a problem solved. Oh, and so funny. trying to get her in, into the IVR, it was it, she just wanted to talk to a human. She didn't care how long she had to wait because she actually just wanted to talk to another human being. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, it's sad, but the 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 insurance company knew that she was going to call and they kind of set that time aside for that specific person as that representative saying, hey, Susie, nice to talk to you again. How's your week doing? And it would just be a five minute conversation. But mm-hmm. again, meeting them where they're at, that's an extreme example, but meeting them where they're at, hearing them out, providing that empathy, listening to them, acknowledging what they're saying, and then doing something about it. That's right. Could you imagine if if they called her, if it was like 158 and they called her first, (laughs) like mind would have been blown. Yeah. It would have been the conversation at the weekly table that she would have had with all of her friends. I can't believe it. And at church and at bingo or, you know, whatever it is that she's doing. And that word of mouth forever. That's right. Very cool. 
So I have a question at the very end uh, that I ask yep. every single guest as well. And it's, if you could leave a note to all customer service professionals, all patient experience professionals, it's going to hit everybody's desk Monday at 8 a.m. What would it say? I give them a little post a note that says, you exist because of your customers, because of your patients. You are all the experience. So don't underestimate the impact you can make on someone else's life. Mm, I would add, choose to inspire them. Like you there said. There you the go. Beginning. Yeah. Absolutely. That, I, I mean, we all have our stories, good, bad, and indifferent of someone that made an impact on our lives, someone we didn't even know. And that memory lasts forever. So why not make it a good one? Hmm. Very cool. Valerie, how do, how do people find you, connect with you? Sure. Check LinkedIn. All your patient experience, amazing. Yeah. Awesome. On LinkedIn. Backslash Valerie Chonyak, C H O N as in Nancy I U K. Would love to meet people, interact, talk, join the PX community. We're a great community of professionals where we get together and we have conversations just like this. We provide webinars and interactive discussions, and it would be great to have you join Nick too. I think experience is relevant no matter what industry you're in. Very cool. I will make sure that is in the notes. So please go ahead and check that out. Go ahead and connect with Valerie. And Valerie, thanks so much for your time. I'm Thank looking you, forward to, to following you and, and the awesomeness that you guys are up to over at the, the patient experience community. Sounds great. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. You bet.